Welcome to Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective podcast, where we meet experts from all walks of life to learn their intrinsic motivation so that they can share it with the world. What do we have in store today? Stay tuned to find out more. Cast Land, you are in tune to another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. This is Hamza. And I am David. And today, really excited to speak with this gentleman. Uh, we've been doing a lot of back and forth, so this is definitely a God wink that we can have it happen today. And glad our audience has, uh, a- has access to him. And in a previous podcast with Jim Self, many people know him, uh, he was talking about 2018 being the year six in that it's, a lot has changed since 2012. And I believe our, our guest kind of believes the same thing because the, the awareness of paranormal uh, afterlife activity, uh, dealing with mediumship and psychic phenomena has grown exponentially so much so that he has taken the time to write a book about it. It is called Deadly Departed, Do's, Don'ts, and Dangers of Afterlife Communication. If that isn't a mouthful, I'm sure he's going to explain a lot more. We can't wait to hear what he has to offer. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Jock Brokus to the podcast. Welcome, Jock. Hey, guys. How are you doing? It's nice to be with you this evening or this morning or whatever, whoever's listening in any part of the world. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Yeah, thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for being here. And uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you. I, I was doing some readings and, and watching your YouTube video, your YouTube channel and signing up to your iTunes. So you're in a lot of places that we are. I think it was inevitable that we were going to speak. Yeah, actually, to be honest, Hamza, I don't do many of these shows. I'm very, very um, – uh, I, I don't do a lot of them. It's just I think because of the book that's come out, people are asking me to do a lot of them. But I'm, I, I kind of – I don't like putting myself out there. And even though I am, unfortunately, it's just it's, it's part of the, the nature of the beast, I suppose. But um, I don't always actually accept shows to do. I, I've turned more down than I've actually accepted. But so it's, it's, it's nice to, to be with you guys. Oh, wow. Thanks. We're so honored. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. It looks like the homies have struck again. <laughs> it, it, you know what? Actually, I think, I think that name, you know, the intrinsic motivation from a homie's perspective, it just kind of ca- caught me. I thought, you know what? I'm just going to do this. this. This sounds quite fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, we right. love it. Just as an aside. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. And, and it, it's funny because over, I think we've been doing it about a year and a half, we're, we're 11 away from number 100. And uh, David and I, we have uh, similar backgrounds. I'll, I'll let David talk about his part. But, you know, we're in a lot of these different communities and have been for years. And there weren't a lot of people that looked like us. And so, you know, people were asking, well, wow, what are you guys getting out of it? And do you have a different perspective? So we kind of put that twist of homie's perspective, and everyone's kind of like, huh, all right, well, let's let's talk to these guys. And I think we're speaking a little bit about us too much because I let it go back to you, and the hour usually flies by. So. Absolutely. Um, I don't want to talk about when you were born, so you don't have to go through your mom being in labor or any of that stuff. Oh, right. But <laughs> yeah, I, 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 that that kind of yeah, we'll put that out of my mind at the moment. Being clairvoyant, <laughs> that kind of bling, brings up a lot of images that you just do not want to clairvoyantly see in your mind. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So we'll, we'll jump ahead a little bit, <laughs> and I do want to talk a little bit about your childhood because. Yeah. You know, just in your introduction, you know, you've um, we've had people on that have uh, access to their abilities their whole lives. They've had it during childhood, and then it kind of went away. And it seems like um, just from your foundation, and I'll let you jump in from your foundation, you from your um, your guess your immediate environment. Your uncle was yeah. a, a monk in a monastery. Yeah. Your dad was a, a Mason. I'm a, I'm a fellow Mason, but your dad oh, was a very fine. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, and, and you're and you're from Scotland, so he's from like the homeland. I know a lot about it. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm sure you kind of fought, ran into some of that in your later years when you were in the military. So, it, in these areas, these are all pretty much third dimension feet on the ground, and here you're inserting yourself and not really coloring within the lines. So, what was it like being in those environments? Well, I think you know here's here's the I'll go back to we'll start from the beginning from my youth. I mean. I hear a lot of psychics and mediums and things on shows, and they'll say, "Yeah, I was always knew I was like a, I was a psychic. I knew I had these abilities." I, I have to be honest, guys. I hadn't got a, a clue, to be honest. You know, I didn't know. Um, I, I didn't know from from one end of what a psychic or a medium was to the other. And but I will say that I had a very spiritual outlook, even since I, even in my younger years, my formative years. Um, I, I, you know, I joined a, a junior ministry to become a priest, and um, I, I was kind of very religious, which was kind of weird because, you know, my granny was a convert, my uncle was a monk, my mum was a Catholic, and my dad was, was Royal Arch in the Masonic Lodge, and, and, you know, so it was like a little bit of a Heinz 57 variety, you know, a little bit of everything there. Um, so there was never, you know, we, we were never forced into religion in any particular way. I mean, it was my choice, really. And um, I was always very spiritual, but I kind of always knew there was a bigger dimension. I knew there was something more than what we were. I just didn't know what it was. You know, I I knew things about people. I I had, you know, instances of intuition and clairvoyance and things like that, but I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what it was until it was until later in life. But I wanted to follow a spiritual path, and I always did that from a very, very, very young age. And it carried on even through my military career. You know, when when we got a, you know, and you you guys have probably had a bit in the military, have you? I did not. I um, I yeah, let you, you jump did, in, David. Yeah, no, I haven't. I have not had a military. It was in the military. So, well, let me say this. So, any so people in the military, there's always. So I'll explain that anybody who's listening to this in the military, you always get a chance to see the padre or you get a chance to see the the, the chaplain. It's very important in military environment that they give you access to that, and but it's never something that's forced upon you. So, but when the opportunity came up, I found myself going and seeing our chaplain and being the only one there. There was no other soldiers there. You know, we're supposed to be a group, and and but I would go and and I would I would see the chaplain and and, and talk to him and get to know him. Um, so I even had that foundation, if you like, even within the military. And I do remember of of certain situations where you know I had brushes with uh, spirits from the other side, and but it's not the kind of thing. You tell your brothers in arms, oh, by the way, I just saw a ghost, or by the way, I saw a spirit, or by the way, you know, that kind of gets you beat up in a locker or something, you know. (laughs) You kind of don't talk like that. You keep it to yourself. But I always had this yearning. I always had this this need for spiritual knowledge, and and I continued in that field. You know, as quiet as it was, I didn't make it, you know, widely known. Um. So I can't say that I had that normal psychic growing up where everything around me was happening and I was seeing ghosts everywhere and seeing spirits and I knew exactly what it was. And I don't think, personally, my perception is a lot of these stories that come from a lot of other, you know, psychics or mediums, you know, there's possibly a a fair bit of embellishment there really because I I didn't know. When I was a young kid, I didn't know what what a psychic was you know and and i didn't believe in it but um but the interesting thing as well is i've always had a kind of scientific perspective and things as well so if i had an experience look you know i i, I would be and i'll give you an example i would i would be in a, a religious group you know a, a spiritual uh retreat for for young men and stuff like that and, and these guys would be seeing you know, oh, I, I saw a lady or I saw this or I saw that and having these amazing visions and, and I was not seeing anything and couldn't experience anything. And wherever they were, 
and, and you know, and claiming that they had seen these visions, I would go back and try and investigate it and try and find out whether it was true. And most of the time, I just thought they were lying through their teeth and making it up. So I, you know, I found it very disturbing, and and I suppose my my desire then was to find out the mechanics of why something was the way it was. You know, why did I have these experiences, or why did I have known that you know the the, the lessons that the priests and things were given us was different, or how did I know a certain thing about my friend, or, or you know. How did I know when people were lying to me? And, and that quizzed me. And so when young kids were, I suppose, out playing ball and all that kind of stuff, you know, I, I would actually hit books and study. And one of the first, you know, one of the first books I ever read was an adult's book called The Vacation, which was about religious ministry. And um, I think I was only like, I don't know, 10 or 11 at the time. And I started studying that kind of thing and things. Like, and, and I was the kind of person where, if a priest or my mother or my grand, I would say about maybe an experience I had, and then I'd be warned about hellfire and damnation and not to uh, not to deal with those kind of things. Then I was kind of like, well, you know what it's like with a kid. You know why? I, 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 you know, why are they telling me not to deal with this? So I want to find out why I'm not to deal with it, and and let me understand. And my mother was. I used to call her. This is please. I hope my mother's not listening to this. But I used to call my mother the old witch. And I never meant that nasty in any way, but my mother used to read horror books upon horror books, and it was always a, a, a well-known writer back in the day called Dennis Wheatley, and he would write really about kind of really dark stuff, you know? And when my mother wasn't, you know, looking, then I would kind of pinch the book and have a little a little read of it and stuff like that, you know? So my, my desire to learn that stuff um, was, was always there. I perhaps never understood or could never label it, but I needed to try and, and, and understand it. And so I, I, I studied the occult practices and occult things from a very, very young age, and and it continued even through the, not so much in my military days, because, you know, being a soldier, you become a bit of a, a bit of a lad and you're all, you know, you're with the boys and you're out, and you, you know, and exercising. You don't really have much time to, to deal with that, but it was still there on the back of my, on the back of my mind. Uh, and I still always try to uh, strive for more spiritual knowledge and stuff. So that's kind of how my my uh, young life kind of took that, you know. And I, you know, even when I was going to school, I would go to, you know, in, in the break time, I would go to the church, I would go to the little chapel, and I would go and pray or meditate in the chapel. And um, and people knew me for that, and I got a bit bullied for it and stuff like that, you know. So. Not a normal kind of childhood, I would say. You know, mm -hmm. it's culminated to where I am today. Oh, absolutely. And um, one of our first podcasts was about Godwinks. And I was estranged from my father until late into adulthood. And I wanted to go, when you were asking about the military, I wanted to, like I had a twin sister, both of us really wanted to. And different stories, different podcasts, but we didn't go. And then right. ultimately, like that summer, uh, uh, the Gulf War started. So it was like, even though our human intention wanted to go there, there was something else uh, that was, um, we just weren't meant for it in buy. this life. Yeah. And and the reason why I bring up my dad is because, you know, years later and, and you know, we rekindled and start talking. He was in Vietnam and he was, wow. you know, up this big flagpole and he fell like and he was supposed to die. And when he fell, before he fell, he he heard that he wasn't going to die there in Vietnam. So <laughs> when when I was, t it was it was like, oh wow, you have these connections that you don't even know until you have these conversations. And the reason why I bring it up is because when you came into your own, I was just wondering when you were saying your mom may be a witch or something. Did people slowly come out and and start opening up to you because of your experiences? You know, I I always found. My wife says to me, whenever someone's in need, God always guides them to you for some reason. Uh, and and that's kind of happened to me all through my life, even in my childhood, in my young childhood. If You know, here was that, and I don't talk about this much, but I, I would, um, 
when I was in the monastery and I would spend a lot of time in the monastery, I, I would prefer to go out and, and feed the poor and, and go out and sit with them and talk with them when they came up to get food from the monastery and things like that, you know. And and, and I would uh, I would prefer, you know, when they took prisoners in, um, I never seen the prisoners as bad people. I, I just saw them as people that were, and, and I wanted to be with them. And a lot of people would be worried about that, but I never felt any fear of it. I just felt that I needed to be with them. And, and I would even go into the town with them in Perth. And, uh, and people would look at, you know, would probably make a judgment on that. But I, I've never, I, I'm not a judging person. I'm a, an incredibly compassionate person. Uh, and I think because of that inherent spirituality or that inherent compassion, I think people intuitively without knowing open up and seek that help or they reach out to a higher power and perhaps then a higher power then puts them in your path. I think that's inevitable with a, with a, with a lot of people that live spiritual lives or spiritual existences. You know, I think with with the the uh, empathy and the compassion that they might have, or the understanding of the, the knowledge that they've gained over a period of time, it does make people. It's almost like it makes people. They don't know they're doing it, but they're opening up because they need to, and and it's almost like they're being guided by a higher force unknown to them. To, to help them on that path. And so I think, you know, that's part of the people did open up to me. Yeah, they, they did. And they still do to this day. And, you know, it it, it becomes more of a, um, more of a focus where it, it's not uh, shocking to me anymore. It's always whatever there is somebody in need they tend to be guided on your path and you, I think you just know, you know, you, you can help them in some way, you know, without seeking adulation or pats on the back or anything, you're just there. My my favourite saying in, in, is a saying by a, a spirit guide called Silver Birch which, is, which says that the, the greatest gift that you can give humanity is the gift of service and I truly, truly, truly believe that with my whole heart and I, I do a lot with veterans. Um, I have a, a deep compassion with veterans and saying you know your father being a a vietnam guy i've met so many vietnam guys and 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 we tend to a lot of people tend to forget that a lot of these guys are not just suffering through agent orange or suffering through you know um ptsd and and you know things like that they're suffering through losing comrades they're, they're suffering through grief uh, and so I have a, a great deal of compassion and empathy for them. So I guess I just get guided to where I need to be, and, and, and it happens, and people do open up a lot more. But I have to say, my spiritual choices, um, guys, have not been well received in my own family, uh, and it has caused a great animosity and, and, and great division. So you have to make a choice, and, and I, I chose to serve spirit. So how do you, if you could walk us through the progression, I mean, you were in a in a environment with some friends and maybe they were seeing something and you were like, I'm not seeing anything, what's going on? Are they full of malarkey? To becoming an evidential medium. First, if you could explain an evidential medium and how did you progress to developing your mediumship abilities? I think one develops mediumship abilities from from the day dot from the day that they're born. I think everybody everybody has, you know, everybody has their, everybody has an ability to sit at a piano and and learn a tune and punk a tune out. But not everybody can play a symphony. And whilst we have inherent abilities that we all have, we are all endowed with uh, a, a more natural capacity for one particular thing. And I think maybe I had a little bit more natural capacity for the mediumship side of things. So it never came to me until later on in life. As I said, you know, guys, I I didn't know I was a medium. I I didn't know I didn't know I was a medium until I went to I mean I, I, I worked in nightclub doors as a bouncer and and all sorts of things and you know and I remember a, a friend uh saying she was gonna go and see a, a, a psychic by the name of Rachel Frass and my father had passed young and um, I said, oh, I, I'll, I'll, 
you know, I'll go and take you and, and to, to see the spooky woman. So I, 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 you know, picked it up and we were we were driving out and it was really, really spooky. You can imagine this. It's up in the Scottish Highlands and you're going out through woods and forestry and everything else. And then you come across this little graveyard. And next to this graveyard, there's trees and then there's this little cottage. And this is where this woman was. And I thought, oh, my God. what it, You know, this is a bit freaky. But So I said, I wait to Alison was there. I said, oh, you go in, you go in and see the old witch and then come back out and tell me what it's like. But I, you know, you're wasting your money. I actually just thought it was a lot of baloney. And I sat in the car and, and I waited and, you know, it was a nice, it was a nice day. And like, she was in there for quite a bit and I thought, oh, I'll just sit outside for a bit, you know. And um, she came out and she was kind of, she looked really happy, Alison. I thought, all right. And this woman looked at me and she says, you're next. I said, no, oh, no. Yeah. She said, I'm not, I'm not going in with you. I'm not wasting my money on this. She said, no. She said, i got something t- to tell you. And just come in. And I said, um, oh, all right, then, okay, in for a penny, in for a pound. We'll see what we're going to do. And I sat down with this woman, and she held my hand, and, oh, my God, she opened up stuff that nobody in, their, in the world would know. And she yeah. brought my father through who had passed by name, um, just everything that nobody would even consider. And it really freaked me out and scared me. And then she said, i got to tell you, she said, you're, you're a natural-born medium. You have been all your days. And in a couple of years' time, or as a year's time, you, you'll awaken to this and you'll, you'll, you'll have a visitation and, and it'll waken you up. She says, but I want you to do something for me. I said, what is it? So she took me into the living room and she sat down and she gave me this ring. And she just said, hold this in your left hand. And she just took me through some breathing. And she says, I just want you to, you know, tell me what's coming in your mind. And so I just told her what I was receiving. And it turned out I was actually getting messages from her late husband, my husband that had passed. And that really, really freaked me out. And I couldn't understand it because I just held this guy's ring. Or I just held this ring that she gave me. And I really didn't know what to do with all that. And then she kind of explained to me, she said, don't worry about it just now. It's not the right time, but something's going to happen. Anyway, cut a long story short. Um, I did get that visitation to the day. I think it was a year or two years later. And my father appeared to me in my apartment in, in north of Scotland as bright broad daylight as I'm looking as I'm looking at someone there was no big connection there was no voices in the air or anything he appeared and he smiled and I absolutely pardon my pun but I crapped myself I didn't know what was going on I, <laughs> I really and I don't mean I, you know it's the only way I can explain it guys I just didn't know what was going on but it, there was no doubt about it that it was my father, and, and it kind of shocked me to the core. And before I knew it, I found myself asking so many questions. And and then I went to when I when we used to go to the club when we going to work and stuff like that, I would pass this little church, this little hall thing, and I called it the kind of spooky church, you know, witches and warlocks and stuff like that. Well, this was a spiritualist church, so I decided. I'm going to go down and I'm going to go down and see them and and see what it's all about. And I went down there. I think I wrote about this in my first book actually. I went down there and uh, the experience that I had in there was was just phenomenal. And I think that was the catalyst. I mean, the door was locked. There was singing. I couldn't. You know, I banged the door and this old woman opened the door and she just looked at me and she says, "Oh, hello, son. We'll be waiting on you. Just and you come." And I was really, really, really scared. And I tried to hide at the back, and I went right up to the back of that congregation, and there was two mediums on the platform. I didn't know what they were at the time, but there was a female medium and this gentleman medium, and she just stood up, and she said, I want to come to that young young gentleman who's just come in. And she, she went on to give me amazing information from the other side, and even in my private life which really kind of 
shocked me a little bit. And I think that was from then on, um, I needed to pursue it. And so my research began in earnest. And uh, I started looking at different healing modalities and, and, you know, psychic phenomena and parapsychology and spiritualism and the occult. I went even, you know, as deeper as I could into it. And um, and I always had this thing in the back of my mind that, you know, about demonology and demons and, you know, from the young age and from me meeting uh, exorcists and that the, the were involved in the, the church at the time. And I was fascinated with all this kind of stuff. And, I, you know, I have to, I have to basically say I, I think there was a – I think Spirit was fishing. They put, a, they put a rod in and they caught me, and that, that was kind of it. And uh, it wasn't long before um, I went I, – I found this card for a, for a woman called, uh, that was running a psychic development course. And uh, I thought, you know, I'm going to go in for this. At the time, I was a personal trainer as well. And I thought, you know – I'm going to go in. I'm going to go for this course and see what it, what it is. You know, being the being the Scotsman, I wanted to you know, and being very suspicious about everything, I wanted to meet up with her, and so I met up with Joanne Pugsley, and um, I tried to get <laughs> tried to get a deal from her. You know, I'll give you some training and stuff like that, and you get me on your course for free. You know, I'm a businessman, so I'm going to look at it trying to get myself a deal. Anyway, it didn't work out that way, and I went on the course, and I was absolutely blown away with it. Well, it you know. That that woman who's now my wife took oh, wow. me as a young, as a young <laughs> fledgling as a young fledgling medium. She took a bit of coal and she turned me into a diamond. And um, I did my first demonstration in a church uh, in the north of Scotland. And from then on, um, I demonstrated with my wife. We eventually, you know, we demonstrated in in, in, in Scotland and in, in Swansea and Wales and further afield as well. We had our own church as well. We ran our own circles. We taught. We 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 basically. I met this woman, and that was it. My life totally changed, and changed for the better. And Joanne was a, a, a phenomenal medium, and and still is. She she doesn't do mediumship just now. She's she's more a uh, she's a, a renowned healer. She's an amazing, amazing healer. But she really took somebody rough. And and uh, and developed me into a professional medium that was worthy of standing in any church and and, and delivering and you know delivering messages and then I I just kept developing and and that desire that knowledge uh, that passion to serve and to to help others through that is is never gone away and and no matter what I've done in my life being in the military or you know, had a job in a toy shop, or even a, as, a, as a young paper boy, or even in in the uh, the monastery, or anything like that. It's um, I think I get the great the, the greatest feeling that you've come and you've came home is knowing that you're being a service and you're helping people through suffering, and even through even though you know my new book is is more about the, the kind of darker side of the mediumship and and stuff like that. It's still an element of service, and it's still an element of helping people through suffering. So, um, it's it's like a passion, like anybody. If if you're a pianist and you love playing the piano, it's your passion, and and you love it, and you'll do everything you can to 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 better yourself that way. And and that's and for me, serving spirit and serving in, in a mediumistic capacity, and teaching, um, is. is of me giving service to, to humanity in, in the way that I can. And it, then you kind of look at all your experiences back in your life and you think, all right, I had to go through all of those to come to this particular point because with all the experiences, um, good and negative, it has allowed me to have a deeper empathy and understanding and compassion for many people. And so... I think experience in life is a great teacher, it's a great educator, but it's also a necessity to be able to carry out service uh, from the world of spirit, I think. Um, but, and I will say, I'm still very scientific, 
I don't believe everything. I'm not new agey in any way, and I don't sit around with crystal balls and, and God knows what else. Um, and I don't believe, you know, I'm very questionable orbs. I'm very big questionable about certain things in ITC. I, I, I'm very scientific in my approach to things. Um, for me, evidence is, is fundamental. And even if there's a haunting or there's anything like this, or people are sub, think they're subjugated by negative spirits or anything, for me, it's still a scientific approach and an evidential approach to, to dealing with anything. So that's kind of how things have developed. I think the, the most unique part of it is I definitely was... Now, here was an interesting thing, actually. I know that my life together with my wife was guided because I remember we were in circle and I got a message from the other side in circle that says, when you see wind farms, you're going to settle down. And there's more evidence things like that. But that kind of thing you don't think of. You think, well, you know, it's wind, farm, wind farms and other places. Well, Joe and I were driving to go and uh, demonstrate uh, mediumship uh, down in South Wales or North Wales. And we went, as we were driving down, um, we got rerouted somewhere. And I seen the biggest wind farms I'd ever seen in my life. And we went to a coffee shop after that. And I proposed to her in the coffee shop that day. Oh, nice. I had never met my mother-in-law. I never met. So the first time I met her, she'd never met me. And, and you know, Joanne had said, though, this is, this is you know, job, this is, and we're going to get married in six months' time. And she just, she just dropped her, she just dropped her dishes on the floor. She couldn't believe it. So that was how I was kind of <laughs> instigated, introduced to that. That side of things. So I, I think there's always been an element of being guided, uh, guided there. Oh, I love it, and um, let me, I love that story of, of all the Godwinks that led up to that. And with that, I have to give a shout out to the Mrs. Future da Mrs. Davis. I don't know who she is, but we're all on our paths, and we will intertwine at some point. <laughs> I'm so. Yeah, uh, but David, I do want you to jump in for a second. I want you to talk about Berkeley Psychic Institute and uh, Lewis's lectures about you might be psychic or you might be crazy because uh, I want to hear Jock's standpoint on uh, mental health and mental illness in relation or oh, is there a that's connection? Absolutely, that's a particular field of study for me. Yeah, well, I, I did a lot of some training uh, at a place called Berkeley Psychic Institute, or BPI as some might refer to it. And the founder of that used to um, do lectures, a series of lectures that were titled You Might Be Psychic, Not Crazy. And it had to do with people having experiences within their li in their life that might get um, looked at in one way, but really it was a spiritual problem. And he was really... Uh, he was a clairvoyant, and he recognized it was an energy and or spiritual problem. So a lot of people might think, oh, this person's crazy, but this is how he kind of got started was he was able to help people from a spiritual point that the doctors and everyone else wasn't able to do anything with them. And so um, that's kind of what uh, Hamza was, was talking about when he mentioned well, that. I tell you what, Dave, I'm going to give you a story, and this story is going to blow you away, because I, I, I have a particular um, fascination and point of attraction with that sort of thing. I actually believe that, you know, there's a famous saying comes from Wayne Dyer, where there's a spiritual solution to every problem. And I don't know, guys, if you've actually read my book that I've released, but my book's actually been supported by highly professional doctors and psychologists. And the reason is because I take the stance that many, much, I would, you know, there's definitely going to be a medical problem in some certain mental element, you know, some certain mental or psychiatric illness. But I believe there's more of a spiritual solution and a spiritual problem to a great deal of these people that, that are perhaps hearing voices or seeing things. And a, and a great deal of this is called spirit obsession. And I had a I had a gent. Um, I won't not say his name because he's still in touch with me, and, and he uh, his, his life had changed. But 
I had a gentleman who had been treated for schizophrenia for uh, most of his days, most of his young childhood. His his mum and his mum was going nuts, and it, it was just destroying the life. And uh, he was on medication, and uh, they were just reaching out. So they, they came across me through somebody, through somebody, through someone. And I started working with this gentleman. He was having um, what they would term as hallucinogenic hallucinations and hearing things and stuff, you know, stuff like that. And I, I knew for a fact that when I sat with this gentleman and, and worked with him and spoke with him and counseled him, that he had a natural mediumistic ability. And what had actually happened is that he was more obsessed with spirit intrusion than anything else. So I worked with him and I educated him. Uh, I helped to clear some things within his life. He is now no longer under the doctors. He is no longer on any medication and his life has never been any better. And he had gone through, he'll be in his 30s now. So he had, he had gone as his mother. His mother wrote to me, and, and um, she couldn't believe the change and everything. The son, and, and I think she had said that he, he had gone through about seventeen or twenty odd years of of these problems. So you can imagine the amount of people that are suffering at the hands of what people will term as a psychiatric illness when. It, in actual fact, it could simply be a spirit obtrusion. And, and what it takes is, is understanding those faculties, being able to work with them, clear them, and, and help and educate that person to, to be able to deal with it. So I believe there's an element of, of the work that we do as mediums that should be uh, developed within the psychiatric or psych psychologist field. Now, I'm not a psychologist, but I, I'm very, very grateful that, that professionals have seen um, the connection that, that, that we have to it. And, and he's not the only one. I, I worked with a, a young woman in Scotland who, whose family had put her, incarcerated her in a psychiatric hospital because she was seeing things and she was seeing visions and she was seeing... You know, God love her. The, the poor girl was basically had a natural mediumistic ability. She had a natural connection to the, to the world unseen. Um, and, and I think when you don't understand uh, the mechanics of the afterlife or the mechanics of the spirit the spirit world, and how you know spiritual law plays a, a, a tremendous role within our lives, even more so than than physical law or material law, it governs everything. You, you recognize that, that a lot of the problems we have in institutions and even in behavioral aspects um, more than likely have more of a, a spiritual uh, imbalance than anything else. And so people who are, are considered to be mad or uh, you know, uh, suffering from mental illness in some way, I would say there's probably a very high proportion of those people um, have a spiritual problem more than, than anything that's remotely uh, imbalanced in the brain. Now, I'm not saying that that's, you know, there is going to be conditions where the brain and, and various, maybe the, the, the spinal, you know, the cortex or the cerebellum or whatever, you know, in, in the brain of this, uh, you know, maybe there's a loose connection somewhere and then that can cause things and there's been a lot of research into that but when you take away all those factors when you've investigated everything possible and you can't come up with a medical diagnosis you tend to just put it down to some kind of dis dissociative the dis dis uh, dissociative disorder uh, and you know um, a mental disorder or or of course uh any psychiatric and, and they do not they will not consider that there may be 
a spiritual solution to it. Now, if we go back to some research that was done way back in the early 1900s, um, we're looking at the, the, the work of Dr. Carl Wickler. And I'm sure if you've done at the Psychic Institute, Dave, you'll, you'll, you've probably heard of Carl Wickland. And, and Dr. Wickland um, did some research, and he, his wife was the trans medium, and she would go into a very deep trance, and there'd be evidence come through of these spirits that inhabited those people that were suffering from mental illness. Uh-huh. <clears throat> that makes sense. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, you know, it just, just, it's real interesting hearing you talk because what goes through my mind is, boy, the stories I could tell you. <laughs> yeah, the stories I could tell you. It would blow your mind. We're going to, you're in North Carolina, we're here in Atlanta. We're going to have to get together one day. And, uh, oh, and, my God, uh, you guys are really close. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we're down the road, yeah. man. Yeah, we're just down the road. Yeah, get in touch with me and just and fire down here. Or uh, yeah, I'd love to see you guys and, and chat and, and get to know you more. Definitely, yeah, do that. You're, you're not far away at all. But you sure. know, there's, there's, there's a lot of you're saying. There's there's a lot of stuff I know you would like to hear, and um, but you know that's we don't have that kind of time. But yeah, I I got some stories for you. <laughs> well, that definitely you you got to come down then because that I I'm in a. I'm into researching and, and taking all these stories in and, 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 and learning and learning from it as well. Because I still learn, you know. I, I, I don't know everything. I, I'm still, you know, here's the thing. There's a lot of people, guys, that would say, you know, they're afterlife experts. And stuff. I'm not an afterlife expert. There is no such thing as an afterlife expert. There is afterlife researchers, and that's all we are. And we will never know the answers until we cross over the other side. But I have no... Uh, I'm not crossing over anytime soon. I've got too much work to do. Um, <laughs> so, but I, I believe, you know, if someone comes to me, and see, if somebody comes to me and they say, you know, they've, they've got a haunt and or they've, they've got, you know, their, their intrusion in their mind or anything else, I don't initiate, I don't just jump into the fact and say you're possessed. And here's the other thing. We also have a, we have also have a, a, a a segment of, of, of people who are within the spiritual and the medical community who will then also label anything as a demonic possession or a possession of an individual and this is the problems. And, and to be honest, sometimes these things are just emotional imbalances. Sometimes these things are just lifestyle, whatever. Not everything that is emotional or psychological in a, of an issue is a demon or a possessed soul. And, and you know, there's a big distinction between obsession and possession. Um, very, very few possessions really occur. Um, it's more of an obsession. Most people are merely obsessed, or what I would like to say to understand, people that don't maybe understand what obsession is, is of an influence. You're being influenced by the spirit on the other side against your, your will. A possession, when you get to the levels of a diabolical possession, is not something that you would ever want to come across. It's not something that you would ever really, it would scar you for life. And people who have just got, you know, psychological imbalances or have emotional problems are not always possessed. And, and, and we, we do a disservice not only to families, but we do a disservice when, when mediums or people go in and, you know, and say these people are possessed. And even, even professionals, even, even, you know, psychiatrists that will go in and say the person's possessed. You know, you, you've got to seriously have a high level of discernment to understand. I would say 99% of cases are just purely spirit obsession um, and, and definitely not possession. We have, if, if we had a thousand cases up in front of us, you'd be lucky if one case would be a, a diabolical possession, a real diabolical possession, because it's not something you'll ever... You'll, you'll, you'll ever experience, uh, you don't want to experience, but it's not something that you can, you, you get over that easy. Um, but I do believe many, even mediums and, and psychics, and, and you know, many people are influenced negatively from the other side. And many people, um, no, it's an interesting thing, you know, 
I, I don't want to go into the, the, the cases at the moment, but do you remember the, do you remember the case recently where, um, was it Molly Tibbetts? Yeah. Or, right. Now, there was a point in that discussion that made me think, oh, hang on, what do we think about this? Do you remember at the point where he, he claimed that he blanked out and he didn't know? Um, no. I, a co-worker was just talking kind of about it, so I just remember the name, and I think she just kind of fill me in, but wasn't she like a college student and she disappeared and then... That's right, that's right, and he, he basically, he, he murdered, he's gone to prison and he murdered her, et cetera, et cetera, but he says, in, in one of the interviews, or one of the things I, I listened to, and it might have actually been on Ashley Banfield when we were talking about it, because he had said that he, he blanked out and couldn't remember. Now, if you look back in a lot of other cases uh, in the past, um, even, um, oh, what was the case way back in early 2000, uh, the women in Texas who stoned their kids, et cetera, et cetera, and, and these, they, they, they claim that they blank out and they don't remember anything. Now, we can look at two sides of the coin here. We can turn around and say, right, that individual um, is lying or they're trying to cover themselves and they're trying to get away with it. But but here's a hypothesis. What if, what if it was a spirit intrusion? What if they couldn't remember anything because they were controlled by a negative spirit on the other side? We don't know, but it's interesting that in many cases, a lot of them will say they blanked out and they don't remember nothing. Yeah, we definitely think together. <laughs> you know, it makes me think of your. It makes me think of your younger life, Jock, when um, you were at the bar and nightclubs. Because when you're in that lower vibration, which is hard for me to say since I spent a lot of time there in my youth, right? You're you're imbibing in spirits, and you're not in your full capacity. So in your full seniority, so you do allow some openings to happen in those environments, at least. One of, one of the biggest reasons I actually came off of doing that was actually pra- was because of my development as a medium. Because the more, the more I developed, the more I was open, the more I could witness more on the other side that was happening there. And, yeah, it, it, you, you don't just go to a nightclub just to get spirits <laughs> in, in the liquid form. But it is definitely a place um, where spiritual entities and spiritual energies exist. And um, I believe there's a lot of influence that happens there. Uh, and, you know, I, for the work that I do now, I, I don't go to bars. Um, you know, and, and if I have a wee dram, like a, a good Scotsman, I do it in my home. And I don't really do it outside. Or maybe if I, you know, if I'm in a way teaching or something and maybe I'll have one in that but I, I do not do that anymore because I don't want to open myself up and, and I certainly don't go into situations or bars where I know it to be uh, harbored by grounded or questionable spirit entities and to the extent which um, way back home when I was visiting you know, my uncle hit my uncle. Oh, still, still got a pub actually in, in Scotland. They, they've got a pub, and it, it, it's in a you know, it can be a questionable area and questionable people going there and stuff. And and um, it was uh, my cousin's wedding reception. I was there, and and I actually had to say to, to my mother, I've got to go because I I don't like the energy in here. It's, it's which she kind of understood, but she kind of looked at me like I was mad, but. I do not have any uh, wish to open myself up to that kind of thing. And and when you are, um, shall we say, more adept at picking up or discerning these energies, you're able then to make that decision. You know, you're looking after your spiritual self as well as your physical self. It's not just mm-hmm. about you know you know using your intuition to keep out of harm's way. There's there's also harm on the other side as well. You know there's also negative aspects on the other side. Uh, and so um, I didn't go into my uncle's pub because there was so much negative spirits and negative things hanging around there. And um, and to this day it's the same. I, I haven't set foot in the place. Uh, and 
I can, you can tell, you know, you, you can, you, you know, you can feel it, guys. You can go to a place, it doesn't even need to be a bar. You can just go into a place and you just feel it, you know. If, if you're, yeah. your, your intuition's strong, yeah. you'll just have that feeling. You'll have that heaviness about you where you're like, well, I'm not really happy here. I'm not, you know, and this is when we need to listen to our intuition and, and, and go out. Um, I will share, I'll share, I haven't shared this yet, but you want me to share you a story about something that happened in Boston the last, over the last week? Go for it. I went, I went to, um, I don't always believe, I, I don't, you know, go around with paranormal teams and stuff, but I, I went to uh, Salem, Massachusetts, and I went there because I also have, I'm an editor of a, a magazine and, and a couple of online magazines that, that I was going to do some research on the witch trials, um, and then we're having a bit of a holiday, and, and I then, you know, my wife would, she books all the hotels because she can't, if I, if I book a hotel, I'm normally looking for the most haunted place and oldest place to go, you know, Joe doesn't like that sort of thing. So we were looking for a, we were looking for a hotel, and uh, I came across the Hawthorne Hotel. I didn't actually know how haunted or anything it was, and but I did see that it was the staging place of the uh, Houdini seance in 1990. So I thought, you know what, I want to go and stay there just to see where the seance was because Houdini was really against the afterlife, and Arthur Ford is a is, is a big influence uh, in, in my life and in my work. And he was the guy that broke the Houdini cord. And so I, I just wanted to go there, not expecting anything. And then so you went to an old place. Now, most old places have got residual energy. You know, there's, there's residual, if you, if you believe in the stone tape theory about ghosts playing past or, or energy that overplays itself. So, but I didn't really take any any belief really I'm, I'm quite skeptical I mean I'll, I'll look out at the haunted places try and go there and, and try and you know tune in or, or find out more and stuff like that and very very often it's really that you come up kind of blank so I never expected anything well I went around you know I did went around Salem did the research you know spoke to a few people and met a few people and I was meeting some other people up there about uh, in Boston about you know my new book and, and arranging some uh, book stuff and it was the last night, and I was lying in bed, and I started to vibrate, and I vibrated very violently, and the bed started to shake, and I heard very clearly my name being called by a spirit. I don't know who, I'm actually writing an article on this now, I don't know who or whatever it was, but it, it was, it, and it wasn't a nice feeling, it was a really negative feeling. And then I witnessed her um, bed covers being pulled. Now, this is, people will say from a psychological point of view, well, it could be the old hag syndrome or he could have been sleeping or something, but this wasn't subjective in my mind. This was completely objective outside of me. And it wasn't in the rooms that everybody claimed was supposed to be on. And I never said anything. I never told anybody anything. So I, I kind of witnessed this. And then I heard some really nasty stuff really out loud and uh, I, I didn't like it at all um, so it was dealt with and it it went it went as fast as it came but when I went down uh, the next day I actually had a meeting with the manageress and 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 I kind of opened up and I said you know this, this is who I am I was up here doing some research for the witch trials etc for a, a piece that I'm writing about um, but this is what happened and I explained it and she says you know something of all the stories and of all the, the things that people say um, yours is more realistic of what people have claimed in the past and it's not in any of the rooms that they claim it's in I was in room 620 uh, and I said well I can tell you it was not a, it wasn't a replay of anything it was definitely there was a spirit interference there was a spirit influence there now that could could that do I know who it was no I don't um it was quite a frightening experience, but it's the first time what I will say is I've investigated, I've been called out to many, many different haunted locations, and there is only two places that I will say that I've really experienced some phenomena. Well, three places. 
One was in a home in the north of Scotland, one was in a castle in Scotland, and one was in Salem. And the rest of the places that I've been has always had uh, some kind of scientific explanation for it. And those three places in all of my life uh, are the only three places where I can probably put my hand on my heart and say, no, there was definitely some kind of paranormal phenomena there, so much so that I do want to go back and do further investigation there, but not, you know, maybe not with paranormal teams, but maybe so with, with, with some trusted people. But um, it was a very, very real experience and quite a scary experience. And uh, could it be, and, and my, my theory is because I am mediumistic and because I'm um, medium, is that whatever or whoever was there was able to try and communicate or, or had just made a beeline for me so whether they came from another room or anything. So I believe that there's, the people who experience things in hauntings have some form of mediumistic ability or they have uh, faculties that, that they, they, they don't know they have, which are, which are easily then opened up. So there's, a kind, of, there's a, a kind of danger in that because when I was experiencing this last week, it felt like it, it, this, whatever it was, was trying to get in to me and kind of take me over, which it would never happen. But um, that's what it felt like. It was quite a scary situation. So they're the only places, even in America where, or even in Scotland, wherever I've been, where, that I can put my hand in my heart and say, yeah, there was definitely phenomena. And the castle that I was in in Scotland, my wife and I actually left uh the next, the, I think it was the second day we left because of the amount of, of spirit phenomena that was there and lights that were going on off and things that were moving and God knows where I just, I couldn't sleep in the place because it was continually just awake with it. So, but anywhere else that I've been, there's normally been a scientific, uh, a scientific explanation, you know, and you, you can normally, you know, pinpoint perhaps what's happening in someone's life or what's happening and, and, uh, in what's supposedly supposed to be a haunting. Um, so, I, you know, I've had those experiences, and but I still remain uh, very sceptical of them, and it just makes me want to investigate more and find out more and, and get to the root of it and, and know why these things happen or the mechanics of it. But at the same time, too, I can realise that curiosity kills the cat. There's, there's, a, there's a dangerous aspect to... Uh, dabbling or, or dealing with the, the, the afterlife and I think people, and that's why I wrote the book you know, to, to just to give awareness to let people, you know, sow a different seed, to let that seed germinate and perhaps let them look at it in a different aspect so that they protect themselves and, and they do it in the right way Yeah, thanks, so thanks for sharing that story no, no, that was great, thanks for sharing that and, and that's what I was going to ask you, you know, especially writing Deadly Departed, Do's, Don'ts, and Dangers of Afterlife Communication. It made me think of, of YouTube, and, you know, we have so much access to this information. And it made me think of uh, the, the uh, forums on Reddit and such. And yeah. it made me particularly think of uh, the Pomagira. Are you familiar with that book? No, I haven't. No, no. Yeah, you, I think you'll like it. It's by Nicolas de Matos. And he's talking about uh, spirit, about spirit, and he's talking about the origins. And he goes into, uh, you know, Africa and and the, and the South America and all this. But in some of the forums, there was just this caution because, you know, we're not treating the spiritual realm with respect. And so it's kind of like, oh yeah, on Friday we're gonna try out the seance or something. And and you were, and then it was like you had come up for the podcast. So I was like, wow, everyone's cautioning about these dangers because they are so unfamiliar and you even with your with your abilities you still are like hey you know what i, I need to <laughs> slow down a little bit in, in, in some of my experiences absolutely absolutely, absolutely. It, it, listen you, you know he there's a there's a, there's a, a saying that i always use and it, 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 you don't need to believe in gravity but it won't stop you falling and hurting yourself if you don't believe that gravity doesn't exist, it don't matter if you don't believe in demons or you don't believe in ghosts or you don't believe in 
negative energy. But we live in a world of opposites. We, we only know light because we understand dark. We only know health because we understand illness. We, all, we have experiential capacities of, of, of these things. And so there's opposites. There's love. There's hate. There's, there's opposites. We have the yin and yang. So it stands to reason that there is, a, there is a good force and there's a malevolent force. And you can't just bury your head in the sand and think no, everything in the garden is rosy. It doesn't exist. You know, you can't see the air. It's not tangible. It's an energy like anything else. But if you didn't have it, you wouldn't exist. You wouldn't live because there was no air. You wouldn't live, but you can't see it. So I, I often, it baffles me why people will just turn around and say it doesn't exist. But the, the problem is, is that we don't treat those on the afterlife with caution, discernment, and respect. And we tend to bring in, and I, was, I did a radio show the other day with Fate Radio, and we were talking about how paranormal teams, or and, and there's some really great, let me say this, in case any paranormal teams are listening, don't be emailing me. Um, it, there's some great paranormal teams, and there's some great mediums, but there's some bad paranormal teams, and there's bad mediums. And, you know, we have good and bad and everything. And so we have to have discernment, not only from the spirit world, but discernment from our own world. And sometimes ill-equipped, egotistical, paranormal teams or paranormal investigators that, that don't really have a, an understanding of the afterlife and the mechanics of it can cause more destruction to people and more, more problems to families who are perhaps really subjugated by a malevolent force. Um, and it can cause even more problems. Now, here's the other problem. Here's the other thing. If I... If we don't know anybody, I don't know you, and, and we meet in a bar, right? Or sorry, a bar. If we meet in a coffee shop, right? And I bump into you and I say, "Hi, how you doing?" Oh, sorry, how you doing? And we we get chatting. We start to build up a relationship. And how did that relationship started? It started by us communicating, okay? And from me asking you a question, we get to working each other's energy, and before you know it, we're developing a relationship. Now, that relationship, and if you look at it from an intelligence point of view, from like government intelligence, they call it human source handling, they can gather information from you, you'll learn an awful lot from, from the person that you're with, and you'll get to know whether they're a good person or they're a bad person, or that person could even lead you. You hear about people that say, well, he, he led little Johnny astray. He, he, he was so caught up, they've built that relationship and they've led them astray, you know, or that, that person, you know, uh, enticed my daughter or something, you know, with, with sweets or whatever it is. There's a natural instinct and it all starts with the desire to communicate, right? So when we're in a situation where we're dealing with the other, the other side of life, that desire to communicate is, is the same, but you don't know what you're communicating with. If I'm standing and looking at you, I can feel your energy. I can, I, I, I can see you, uh, and and I I have a, a, a visual stimuli that that will give me auditory and visual stimulus that will help me to make a decision on that energy. But let's not be you know uh, stupid about it. Spirits on the other side know more about you than you know about you. That's all right. You know, and you you opening that channel of communication, that desire to communicate, you can get that communication, but slowly but surely, you don't know where it's going to lead you. And so people who are ignorant or don't have the, the, the potential of, of learning real discernment through their life or being able to discern that often can get led down a very dark paths. Uh, and even mediums can get led down that, that dark path. And so I just want to caution people that you might be a paranormal investigator, a psychologist, a medium. The desire to communicate is all that's needed. So even when you go into a situation, if you start calling upon spirits in a room, you know, you you can have some serious problems. Now, 99% <laughs> of the time it might never happen. But look at the 
look at the problem. I mean, the, we have a very famous paranormal investigator who was given it up. I'm not going to mention his name, but it's, I mean, he's all over the net because he had negative experiences through communicating through, you know, EVP. And everything can be benevolent for a very long time, but it only takes that one connection, malevolent connection, that can masquerade as something positive and start to draw you in. So you need to understand spiritual law. You need to, you need to be able to, to be able to discern and to realize that, you know, communication like that is very dangerous. It's, it's not something I would recommend to anybody. And even me as a medium, I'm very aware of it. My, my mediumistic work or the work that I do, if people have problems, um, I would caution anybody who's looking to communicate to do it in the right way with the right training, the right development, the right dedication. Um, just because you've gone through all your life as a medium and not expect not dealt with anything negative doesn't mean it won't happen and doesn't mean that it, it skips you and might go to somebody else. We do have cases in all faiths and all belief systems, whether it's the Native Americans, whether it's the Aborigines, whether it's indigenous tribes and jungles, Every single one of them have a constant belief in uh, demonic or evil, malevolent energies. And that's just a fact of life. So I think I would rather be aware of it than, than not. And I'd rather be prepared than I'd rather prepare other people for it. I, you know, I'm not going to be one of these people that say, you know, <laughs> the, the, the world is nigh and we're all doomed kind of thing, you know, walking around and... But you just have to have that awareness, you know, that there's good and there's bad. And there's good and the bad in the afterlife. And don't be caught up with all the egotistical, I've got to communicate with a ghost routine. Or, you know, look at, there's a big problem in mediumship where it is, I say in my book, I coined a phrase called the Gucci handbag syndrome of mediumship, which is the new coolest thing to do. It used to be years ago, guys, that you, it was hard to find a medium. I mean, really, you just need to go to your next door neighbour, and they're all they're all mediums. Everybody's a freaking medium these days, <laughs> or everybody's a psychic these days. They're, they're, they're in every con I went into a shop um, with my mother-in-law when she was out visiting, and I normally do not tell anybody that I'm a medium or anything. I just say, you know, I, I run a marketing business, and that's about it. Uh, or I write, you know, I'm an editor in a magazine or something. And uh, the minute I said. I don't know why he was in this thing. They said, what are you doing? I said, well, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm a medium. And that person went, yeah, I'm a medium too. And I looked and I thought, you're like 14. <sighs> really? And then she goes on to tell me about all these problems that they're having at their uh, home and that they were dealing with Ouija boards and they feel really bad about it. And there's complete ignorance right there that can turn your life upside down. It happens, guys. You know, it's it's not. People don't need to not believe in it. it don't don't say it don't exist. So I, I'd rather be aware of it than not. And that's why I wrote the book. I wrote the book to to help people to develop safely, to understand the mechanics of the afterlife, the, the, the other side, and and to be a guide to them, um, to just sow a seed of knowledge that that they might look at it in a different way. They don't have to like it they, they don't have to believe in it but i'd rather that they were aware of it absolutely uh any other questions david uh, now we covered a lot there <laughs> i told you i was like we got to get them on and that hour's going to fly by uh but before we let you go jack I, yeah man it's that time already uh i do want to ask you because uh, it, it's related to one of your last videos on your youtube channel yep. and a good friend of mine and, and david knows her too um She's, she's a little older than us, and her mother had come through uh, during a reading, and she thought her mom was going to spend some time with her and hang out, and the mom was like, all right, I got to go. I got some things to do. And, then, and in one of your last videos, you were talking about uh, being spiritually selfish, and I'd love for you to talk a little bit about that. Absolutely. That's a fantastic thing. Um, I'm glad you watched that, actually, because 
when people are grieving, I feel really sorry for them because they think that they're, and, and, and mediums give them the wrong impression. They'll say, oh, your husband is with you or your son is with you all the time. And then they hang on to this whole relationship that they, they've, they've got their, 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 their loved one there and their loved one never leaves them their side. And they then get reliant upon that and then they start to communicate or they start to try and do you know, delve into different things that they perhaps shouldn't do because grief is one of the I would say grief can also be grief is a terrible thing to go through and I, I, I hate anybody suffering through it and I want to help them but I, it's also a, a catalyst as well for, for imbalance and it can be a catalyst for, for even questionable spirits to, to try and get you they don't care that you're grieving they just want to they just want to get into you and so what happens is is what i try to do is if i do sittings with people uh, or i do you know private um group i i will teach them and i try to teach them um how to balance their life more within their grief and within the the realities of how the mechanics of the afterlife work and tell them you know, you can't be selfish. You can't have, you, your loved one is not going to be there 24 7 at your beck and call because you're being selfish hanging on to that energy. And whilst you're drawing them in, you're, you're kind of, you're doing it from a selfish perspective. You're not letting them go because what, the, the reality of the afterlife is it's, it's a real life. You know, they do have, the, you know, you don't pass over and sit in a little fluffy cloud with a harp and sandals. <laughs> And listen to angels singing. You have work to do. You, you you get you you get a job, and and you can you can go and, and learn in university. Well, not universities, but you know, in, I don't know, heaven school or whatever you want to call it. You know, um, Emmanuel Swedenborg's work's really good. If you get a chance, I don't know if you, you've uh, Dave, if you did that from Psychic Institute, but um, Emmanuel Swedenborg's work is, is very, very good because it gives you an understanding of, of the process, the afterlife, and also any work by Silver Birch and some of the old, not modern texts, right? Forget all the modern new books that are coming out to tell you what the afterlife's like. I will always say to people, read it for interest, but go back to the old knowledge, go back to the books in the 1800s and the early 1900s and even before study them because those are when the, 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 there was rawness within the spiritualistic uh, information. Who were those two people again, Jack? Uh, Emanuel Swedenborg, Silver, Silver Birch. Um, I can give you a list of tons, uh, uh, tons of, of, of good quality uh, books that you can refer to. And if, and if you want that, I'll drop an email and I'll, I'll – actually, I've got some. I'll send you some on PDF. i got loads – um, okay. But we'll do we the same with have, uh, Nicholas. Yeah, we all we also have the you know people who are, are who are grieving. Then we'll start to. I'm very skeptical of out of body experiences, um, and I'm skeptical of a lot of things within the, the the afterlife community because for me I have to have evidence. I have to have some form of evidence. If you say you've got an out of body experience, then bring me evidence back. I had a near-death experience, but I can't talk about it because I got no evidence of it. So, you know, it's personal to me. Um, whilst I think there's a lot of validity in the near-death experiences and, and things like that, we, we still need to have a skeptical outlook to it. And I think someone who's grieving should as well because what happens is, is they hang on to that idea that their loved ones are there and then they start to cloud themselves with visions they're having and everything else and not really and there is a selfishness to it you have to get to the point where you want your your loved one to go and develop you want them to enjoy their life yes they'll visit you in visitation they can visit you in your dreams they can visit you i mean for goodness sake i, I have a better relation my dad and i when we were t we were when he was alive we did not get on we did not have a good relationship. I have a better relationship with my father now than I've ever had in my life. And he's not at my beck and call all the time, but he'll pop in, you know, every now and again and, 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 and say hello. So I, I'd rather people understand, you know, people on the other side have a life. They are alive. They are not dead. Dead is an illusion. Death is an illusion. We continue on. Like the leaf that falls from the tree, it doesn't just stop being a leaf. 
it regenerates, it, it, it goes into the ground, it goes through the whole process of going up, you know, the energetic manifestation of what that leaf is changes. And it fertilizes the ground, and the ground change, and moisture goes up in the air, and it comes back down, and it, you know, it, it feeds another tree who grows another leaf, and so we have the whole circle of life. So life does not end. Life is continual. And so when our loved ones pass, they're just moving on to the new life. And you've got to let them have their new life. They will visit you, and they will let you know that they're around and they love you. And they want you to, to awaken to the fact that they exist. But they don't want you to hold on to them in their grief, thinking that they're there every single day because it's not doing you any favors. And it's not helping you through uh, your grief. And the other thing that I'll say, anybody who's listening here, if a medium turns around and says they can help heal you from your grief, run, run fast, and don't look back. Because no one can heal you through grief. My job as a medium is to take your hand and to walk with you on that journey to show you that you're not alone and to give you the evidence that your loved ones exist. Essentially, the work of healing through grief or moving through the journey is yours and yours alone to do. I'll just be your companion. I'll, I'll hold you when, when, when you're needing to be held. And I'll hopefully awaken you to what needs to be there. But I also want you to know that your loved ones have got their lives over there and they're developing and they're learning and don't be selfish and just hanging on to them every two seconds because you're creating an energetic bond that you're not harboring them because that's that's a wrong thing but you're harboring yourself on moving forward a lot of media will say that if you're harboring them and holding them back well, I don't believe that I think that's I think that's highly questionable because spirit is spirit. They have a life over there and and they also still have their free will choices. They have their choices. They're more awakened over there and they're learning. So I, I think we've got to, you know, yes, your spirit, your, your, your loved one will come and hang out with you for a bit. You might go on holiday and feel your loved one around you, but they're not there 24-7, you know, going down the water chute with you at the, you know, <laughs> islands of adventure or something like that. <laughs> you know, and, and you're not going into the Harry Potter theme park where you're in, and you know, flying around the, which is awesome, by the way. I, lo- I love that. Right. <laughs> I, I sense that you were there mentally for a second. <laughs> I, I, was there. I, I was I was I was there. I was on. I was like, dude, I've gone around that thing in circles. <laughs> my, my wife was getting, you know, getting absolutely annoyed waiting as she's having her second butter beer. Um, but, you know, they, they're they not doing that. You know, they will come in in flights of fancy. They will come in and let you know they're around you. They will visit you when you're having experiences. They will let you know they're around. And they will send you signs, signs that are around. They're able to learn to manipulate energy, extend, you know, outside of you, like, you know, uh, animals or, or, or different things or make you aware of something. So they'll send you those signs they're not living with you 24-7. And that is a potentially dangerous thing to do, especially the desire for someone who's grieving to communicate can be so much that it can lead them into a false sense of security and it can cause them even more harm. And also, a medium can cause them even more harm. And I said this on another show the other day because it, let's, let's say, for instance, you know... Um, I'm reading for a woman, and the woman's lost her son. And I've given loads of good evidence and everything else, but I then turn around and say in a joking fashion, oh, your son's really not happy with you because you've, you know, you've maybe put the beef on or something, or you, you, your son's not happy with you because you're not eating well. That woman does not remember all of the really good stuff that you've just told her with the evidence, she only remembers, my son's not happy with me. And that causes even bigger grief turmoil. So you haven't actually helped that person. You've caused her to go into spiral and deeper grief. And I've had many, many people come to me after going to 
uh, other mediums and, and actually experiencing that problem and, and going in. You know, when you have someone that goes for a mediumship reading and comes out feeling worse than what they ever have, that's that's not a good thing. So I think we have a duty of care to really... I, I can teach anybody to, to get some evidence from the spirit world, but that doesn't make them a medium. Life, well understanding, compassion, wisdom, understanding the mechanics, knowing how to discern even in your choice of words or how you deliver something, and having that empathy of that person, understanding the grief, uh, that's what makes a good medium. Well said. And and for those that want to get started and going down this direction, uh, the book is Deadly Departed, Do's, Don'ts, and Dangers of Afterlife Communication. Jock, where could they get that, and how could they get in touch with you via social media if they would like to know more information? They have. They can. Uh, they can go on my website. They can go on any online bookstore. Um, they can go into some other bookstores. But you, you, my website is jockbrokers. dot com. Um, I also have a, a deadly departed uh, uh, podcast that I have started, which I answer questions. And I'm going to be bringing. Actually, what I'm going to be doing is bringing readers in and talking to the readers and getting their experiences rather than it being about me or being about the book. I'm going to make it more about the readers. Um, and I also have a Facebook group called uh, Deadly Departed Readers Group, which we just started. And uh, if people buy the book, they send in, um, one of my admin there, will, they can send in a picture of them holding the book. They get into the group and they can ask as many questions. And what I do is I actually answer each and every individual question on video as a lesson. Uh, to teach uh, and, and give as much knowledge as, as I can share as possible. So for me, the book's not finished. The book is, uh, I say and I've said many times, the book is alive. It is, it is a book with its own consciousness. It will never be finished. It will continually be under development. And so this is just the first part and the first stage of, of Deadly Departed. Uh, and it will continue to develop and continue to grow. Uh, and I, I want to thank you know, people that have bought it. I, I never wrote it uh, in order to make money out of it or anything. None of my books have been like that. And, and people who know me will understand this. I write for one reason or one reason only, is to educate and to help ease suffering. And I'm happy if that helps people. Not everybody's going to agree with what I say, and that's okay. You know, everybody can have their own opinions, just an opinion. But I would rather sow a seed that makes somebody's life a little bit better, and, and that's exactly what it's for. And it will keep, it will can keep developing. So they can follow me on uh, Twitter and Facebook and um, the usual social media. You can just put in my name, and, and you'll find it there. But Deadly Departed is my new uh, podcast. Um, and you can buy the book really anywhere online. Just go on Amazon. It's the easiest place right to do it or go into the local bookstore. And since it's a work in progress, we'll, we'll definitely pay, stay in touch. So uh, with that, you have just been in tune to another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. This is Hamza. And I am David. Jock, since you're down the road, man, let's definitely stay in touch. Absolutely. You're not far away, guys. Drop me a line. Let's get together. It's you, you're not far at all. Um, so yeah, I'd I'd love to sit down and, as they say in the army, pull up a sandbag and swing a light bulb. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Very nice. Thanks for your time. Yeah. Awesome. All right, Hans. All right, Dave. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed it, guys. Cheers. Thank you. God bless. Thanks again for checking out another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homies Perspective podcast. 
please check us out on our website at intrinsicmotivation.life where you can click on the speak pipe button and leave any suggestions for a future podcast that you'd like us to cover. Also check us out on our social media sites. We have a YouTube channel, Facebook page, iTunes podcast, in addition to Stitcher and Google Play, all under Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. Check you out next time. Have a great day.